Welcome to the Preston Road Online Worship this weekend. You may be asking yourself, why are you standing in your backyard? Well, there's a real simple answer for this. This has become my second office. I didn't realize how much being outside and being with people is something that I would miss during this period of isolation. So on nice days like today, I love getting outside, doing my reading, taking care of emails, doing the stuff that I would normally do sitting at my desk, but just being outside. I was reminded recently post that was done on social media of something that took me back 30 years. Now, I don't know that it was at ACU leadership camps where I first heard this saying, but it's where I remember it at. And it just is simple, and it goes like this. God is good all the time. And then we would respond, and all the time, God is good. God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. You know, that was easy to say sitting at camp around, not a bonfire, but in the amphitheater at ACU, at night, surrounded by people who were experiencing camp together. And you could feel the Spirit of God in that place. And so it was easy to say God is good all the time. But if I'm going to be real honest with you, there have been days over the last month that that has been hard to say. And yet in the midst of some of the darkness that, that we experience when we're in isolation and, and being alone, there have been light, there has been light that has shone into the darkness through some of the actions and the acts and, and the kindness and the love that our Preston Road family is showing towards other people and especially to some of our own members. This past Friday, I'd sent out an email to our member care team and to our young adult class and said, if you have time to volunteer, we have some Easter lilies we want to deliver to some of our senior members who live alone and to others who live in assisted care living centers. And I said, let's come from 1 to 3. And between 1 and 2.15, I had almost 20 volunteers show up. And in just a little over an hour, we had 40 Easter lilies that had gone out the door and were delivered to some of our members who are living by themselves, who are in isolation, maybe more so than some of us. And it was just a reminder to them that you're not being forgotten this Easter. That your Preston Road family remembers you and we're praying for you. And, and we hope that was an encouragement to those members. I've also seen light in the last few days as members of Preston Road have said, hey, you know what, we know that we have members that might could be blessed or would be blessed by receiving meals once or twice a week, just a way for the people who aren't getting out at all to have a fresh meal, to have somebody stop by, and always we're mindful of social distancing right now. And we're being safe, but at the same time, members who are feeling compelled to love others. And a special word of thanks to Nikki Samuel, who approached me and has been very proactive in helping us identify members who might be blessed by this. And so I want to tell you this. If you're one of those members and you might have been not on a call sheet, I want you to know that we want to help you. And if you would be blessed by receiving a meal, once or twice a week, please call me or, or send me an email. I would love to connect you up with Nikki Samuel. And, and we want to express love because we are concerned for our Preston Road members. If you've been on the website, you may have noticed that there's an ad up now for our Barnabas ministry. And it simply says, Members Helping Members. Our Barnabas ministry was established for members who, through emergency and through crisis, 
find themselves in a difficult financial situation and need some assistance. And we realize right now that we have members who have been out of jobs, members who have been furloughed, members who have had a reduction in salary. And we want you to know that we're here to help. If you're wondering about housing, if you're wondering about where your groceries are coming from, or if you just need some assistance with bills, let me encourage you. One, you can go to the website, click on the Barnabas ad, and there's a brief form for you to fill out there. And that will automatically send an email to myself and to a couple of other of our Barnabas team. And one of us will be back in contact with you within 48 hours. You can also drop me an email, give me a call, and I would love to point you in the right direction because what we want our members to realize during this time of crisis, during this time of uncertainty, is that the Preston Road family is here, we're standing by you, and we want to assist any way that we possibly can. Some days it is hard. Some days it's more difficult to say God is good all the time. But for me, and I hope for you, that through the acts of encouragement, through the acts of love that I see, both that have been directed towards me and the encouragement I've received through emails, texts, phone calls, but also as I've taken time to be the person encouraging, one of the truths that I've realized is sometimes the most encouragement I gain is when I intentionally seek to encourage others. So during this time where there may be darkness, where there is isolation, where there is loneliness, let's remember that God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Let's continue in our worship together. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider Stars. I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to me, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to me. can take it in, that on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, He bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to me, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to me, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation, and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart.
Yeah, zoom in just a little more. A little more. Perfect. That's perfect. Hello, everybody, and thanks for joining us today. How's your heart? Or, more importantly, how's your hair? Every day, I feel more and more like Everett, George Clooney's character in O Brother, Where Art Thou? I wake up every morning, and my first thought is, <gasps> my hair. We're continuing our journey through Romans today. We're using Paul's letter to the church in Rome to explore some of the basic concepts of Christianity. And over the past several weeks, I've been pleasantly surprised how much Paul says in Romans 5 through 8 speaks to our current situation, a time in which we are being challenged to depend more deeply on God's grace and trust more fully in God's Spirit, who is both within us and ahead of us, leading us through a particularly difficult chunk of wilderness on the way to a better time and better place, not only for ourselves, but for all of creation. Today, we're moving out of Romans 8 and into Romans 9. We're going to cover a fairly large chunk of Paul's letter. And if later on you read through Romans 9, 10, and 11, I think you'll see why. It's when you read Romans 9 through 11, line by line or verse by verse, it can get complicated and confusing in a hurry, mostly because Paul uses more quotes and allusions from the Old Testament in this section of the letter than in any other section. And unless you know your Old Testament really, really well and you're familiar with how Paul likes to use the Old Testament in his letters, it's easy to get lost. But when we step back and rather than paying attention to every nook and cranny of his argument, when we step back and assess his overall message in this section, his larger point or points are a bit easier to grasp and they have something important to say to us today. But it's going to take a little bit of work first to get there. So if you need to, hit pause, grab a fresh cup of coffee, and then open your Bibles to Romans 9 and let's get to work. Romans 9 begins on a somber note with Paul grieving that so many of his Jewish brothers and sisters have not yet pledged their allegiance to Christ. Even though they occupy a privileged place in God's story, even though they are recipients of the promises of God, even though they trace their lineage back to Abraham, the same lineage out of which the Christ was born, they still do not believe. Paul even goes to the point of saying that he wishes he could be cursed or cut off for the sake of his people so that they could believe. So deep is his grief. But then, by the end of chapter 11, Paul has preached or explained or dictated his way into a frenzy of praise, which we'll read later. And whatever Paul says in between his initial grief and his finale of praise it's worth paying attention to, especially if you're feeling kind of low today and in need of a reason to praise God. So what Paul does in this section is he uses the problem of Israel's unbelief and rejection of the gospel as a platform from which to spotlight God's amazing, surprising, abundant grace and God's mysterious, relentless, creative mercy. So here's what I hope is a short summary of this section. He begins in chapter 9 by recounting some of the surprising moves God has made in Israel's story from Abraham all the way up to Christ. These moves include God choosing to use specific and unlikely members of Abraham's family to move the story forward. God chooses to use Isaac, not Ishmael. Jacob, not Esau. Even though both Ishmael and Esau are the firstborn sons. 
And God chooses Isaac over Ishmael, not because Isaac is a better person. God chooses Jacob over Esau, not because he's more righteous than Esau. Go back and read Jacob's story in Genesis, and you will see he's a scoundrel, a rascal, unrighteous all the way through. No, God chooses to use Isaac and Jacob because God chooses to use Isaac and Jacob. That's the way God works throughout Israel's story, defying conventional wisdom and practice, always surprising with his choices. And then Paul mentions how God saves Israel from Egypt. Again, not because they were righteous, not because they deserved it. After all, they were already rebelling against God while the waters of the Red Sea were still settling. No, God saved Israel not because they deserved it, but because that's the way God's creative mercy moves the story forward. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, says the Lord. So the big idea of Romans 9 is that Israel's story, Israel's identity has always been rooted in God's grace, God's mercy, God's faithfulness. God did not choose Abraham or specific members of Abraham's family or the nation of Israel because they were better because they were more righteous, because they were more worthy or deserving than others. God did not choose them because of their works. They were chosen by grace and because of mercy. From the very beginning of the story, God has always accomplished his purpose by working with and through unrighteous, unworthy, undeserving people whose faith, whose righteousness can never live up to or match God's faithful righteousness. And moving into chapter 10, Paul explains why so many of his Jewish brothers and sisters have rejected the gospel. Rather than receiving Christ as yet another one of God's gracious gifts to them and to the world, they stumble over Christ because in part the message of the gospel offends their racial and religious pride. They cannot accept the good news, the gospel, that Gentiles can be included in the family of God by faith apart from the law Because Israel has rooted their identity and located their righteousness as the people of God in the law rather than the faithfulness of God. And so Paul says instead of letting the law lead them to Christ, who is the focal point of God's plan and promises, they make keeping the law the focal point of their life with God. And it's this misplaced focus, focus on the law and their own righteousness It causes them to stumble over Christ who reveals the righteousness of God and who fulfills God's promise to Abraham to give him a family. And so then moving into chapter 11, and I know I'm skipping a lot, you're welcome. Paul explains how God can use, or maybe even cause, that's a philosophical conversation for another day, how God can use Israel's stumbling, Israel's hardness of heart, Israel's disobedience to accomplish his ultimate aim, which is to bless the whole world through the family of Abraham. Then another surprising move, God uses Israel's rejection of the gospel, Israel's unbelief to make way for Gentiles who are pledging their allegiance to Christ, the Jewish Messiah, to be included in the family of God. And because Gentiles are being included, more Gentiles are being included than Israelites, Paul says it it might be easy to assume or conclude that God has given up on Israel or that God's plan or promises for Israel have failed 
Paul said it's just the opposite. This is just another way that God keeps his promises, that God accomplishes his goals. God's not given up on Israel. God has not moved on from Israel. No, God is keeping his promise to Israel by including Gentiles and thus giving Abraham a worldwide family. And so, as God is keeping his promises to Abraham through Israel's disobedience, he is at the same time blessing the Gentiles. God's creative mercy uses Israel's disobedience to God's advantage for the good of all. This is the way God has always worked in Israel's story. It's amazing, it's surprising, it's creative, but God has to get creative with his mercy and grace when partnering with sinful humanity to recreate his world. But Paul doesn't stop there. At the end of chapter 11, he expresses his hope That in another surprising move, God could use Gentile obedience to bless disobedient Israel by arousing jealousy within Israel and breaking their pride so that they would finally humble themselves and embrace Christ as Lord and accept believing Gentiles as their brothers and sisters in the family of God. Now at this point, it's appropriate to wonder, to ask, So what? Why is Paul taking us through all of this? It's not because he needed to add another three chapters to get his word count up for his publisher. He's not doing what I sometimes do, and that's add more material to my sermons to make them longer. Just kidding. My sermons are always as short as they can possibly be. Paul's not showing off not doing abstract theology. Remember, Paul has an ultimate aim himself as he's writing this letter. And it's not to tell sinners how to get saved. It's to encourage Jewish and Gentile Christians to get along with one another, to love and accept one another as they worship and eat and serve together. There's tension in the church in Rome between these groups because one group is looking down on the other group. Both groups are harboring superior attitudes over the others. Jewish Christians are looking down on Gentile Christians because the Gentiles aren't taking the law of Moses seriously. They want to worship the Jewish Christ and follow the Jewish Lord, but they don't want to keep the Jewish law. And Gentile Christians are looking down on Jewish Christians because of their low social standing in Rome, but also because the Jewish Christians insist on practicing their unnecessary and in some cases outmoded, outdated religious traditions. And so Paul uses God's grace, God's creative mercy as an equalizer. Both Jews and Gentiles embracing Christ are included in the family of God by grace because of mercy not because of their ethnic heritage or their religious background or their social standing or their moral effort. It's all grace. It's always by mercy. And so to the Jewish Christians who are wondering about the faithfulness of God. Why have so many of their brothers and sisters rejected the gospel? And why are so many non-Jews, Gentiles, coming in and being accepted into the family of God? Paul says, don't give up on your Jewish brothers and sisters. God hasn't. God's plans for your people have not failed. He has not moved on. Rather, God is using this moment to include even more people in the family of God. He's using their unbelief to keep his promise to their forefather Abraham, to give Abraham 
a faith-based, not law-based, not race-based, a faith-based family that will bless the whole world. So Paul says to his Jewish brothers and sisters in Christ, stop insisting that the Gentiles keep the law. They've pledged their allegiance to Christ who has fulfilled the law. They're keeping the law by following Christ. But then his message to the Gentile Christians in the church in Rome is a bit sharper. And I want to read part of what he says to them in Romans 11 when he uses the branches of an olive tree as an illustration. Let's begin reading in Romans 11. I'll start in verse 13 and then skip down to verse 17. I am talking to you Gentiles. If some of the branches have been broken off, and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, well, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Yes, granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief. And you stand by faith. So do not be arrogant, but tremble. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. So Paul reminds the Gentile Christians in Rome that as they're displaying arrogant and superior attitudes toward their Jewish neighbors who have not yet accepted the gospel, as they're looking down on their Jewish brothers and sisters in Christ in the church, he reminds the Gentile Christians of their place in the story of God. He reminds them that they are not original branches on the tree. They were wild shoots grafted into a tree that was planted while they were still off worshiping idols. They were grafted into a tree that has always been rooted in and nourished in God's grace. So the message for Gentile Christians is the same for Jewish Christians. They are included in the story. God has chosen them to be a part of his family tree, not because of their righteousness, not because they're worthy, not because they deserve it, but because of God's amazing grace and creative mercy. But in the same way that Paul says Israel lost track of the plot and began to boast in themselves, began to take pride in their own righteousness, and were therefore cut off from the grace root, Paul warns Gentile Christians about boasting in anything other than God. Because God's grace is amazing, and it is surprising, it is also humbling. Grace the gift of God that saves us doesn't leave us with a prideful leg to stand on. It leaves no room in the church for self-righteousness, no room in the family of God for ethnic pride, for anti-Semitism or for racism of any kind, no room in the family of God for economic privilege, no room for superior attitudes, thinking we're better than others. Because we have been chosen by God. We have been included by God in God's story, in God's family tree. Not because we are better than, or smarter than, or wiser than, or more capable than, or more deserving than, or more righteous than others. We have been included because God has chosen to display his grace and his mercy through us. You have been included in the family of God, in the family tree of God, not because God 
loves you more than he loves others or because God wants to save you and condemn others, but because God has chosen to put his grace and his mercy on display in the world through you. And your job is to be a sign that points to the faithfulness of God at work in the world in you. And the quickest way to lose your job, Paul says, is to boast in yourself. To think of yourself more highly than you should, to use this phrase from Romans 12. Paul says that kind of attitude can get you cut off from the tree. So instead, Paul invites all of us, rather than boasting in ourselves, boast in the grace and the mercy of God. And it's this retelling of the story of God's grace and mercy revealed in Christ at work in the world, at work in the church, at work in disobedient Israel that lifts Paul out of his grief grief, and causes him to launch into praise. God's creative mercy, God's amazing grace will not be thwarted by human disobedience. In fact, it's disobedience that gives God the opportunity to display even more grace as God calls more and more people into his family. All different kinds of people, unified in loving one another. If you want a verse to ponder this week, consider this one from Romans 11, verse 32. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. God has bound them all over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. And it's this thought then that launches Paul into praise beginning in verse 33. He says, oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of God? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them for from him and through him and for him are all things to him be the glory forever. Amen. And so here we are in the midst of a crisis. And we are the people of God. Recipients of the gospel Stewards of the good news of the crucified and risen Christ, ascended into heaven, reigning as King of kings and Lord of lords. We are filled with the Holy Spirit, God's empowering presence within us and ahead of us, leading us onward. How are we to use our blessings in Christ to benefit others? For God is using us in this moment. Not because we're better or smarter or wiser, but because we are the ones God has chosen to use. May we root our confidence not in ourselves but in the amazing grace and creative mercy of God. And may we trust God to use us in our weakness, through our weakness, no matter how unworthy we feel for the task ahead, no matter how fragile our faith is from day to day, may we trust God to use us to display his faithfulness, his grace, and his mercy to all. And may the faithfulness and the grace and the mercy of God be in your heart and in your home and in your life this week. Stay in peace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that 
saint, a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. My chains are set free, my God, my Savior, has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace, the Lord has promised good. His word, my hope, secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love. Oh.
Hello, church. I'm Kenneth Kirkland, and I am blessed to serve as one of your shepherds here at Preston Road. On behalf of the elders, I just want to let you know how much we are thinking of you and praying for you. The elders and ministers are getting together weekly to talk about our church and to pray for you. Your safety and spiritual well-being is of utmost importance to us at this time. And we are trying to do everything we can to help you during this time. We are extremely thankful for the way that you have responded to this crisis. Your acts of service and kindness and compassion to our community, to our church, and to your neighbors has been outstanding. And we thank you from the bottom of our heart for your work. I also realize that there are times when people are suffering and you're suffering in silence. You're suffering and because of the stress of the situation, stress of family, stress from loss of jobs, and we want to pray for you. If there is anything that we can do, please let us know and we will try to do our hardest to help you. I want to encourage each of you in your daily devotional time. With the shelter in place, this is the greatest opportunity to practice being still and knowing that God is God. Take time to reflect upon His goodness, His creation, and the blessings in your life. And as you pray, please remember our doctors and our nurses, our senior citizens that are isolated. Please remember those that have lost loved ones in our church as they mourn. Please remember that we have members of our church that are fighting cancer and undergoing treatment. Pray for their protection as their immune systems are compromised. Pray for families of school-aged children and little ones at home. Pray for our city, state, and federal officials as they work to navigate every detail of this crisis. Pray for those that are struggling financially that they will persevere. And for those homes where peace is not found, pray for protection to cover the children and the women that are in desperate situations. In preparation for the Lord's Supper, I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Please join me as we pray for the Lord's Supper. Dear Father, praise be your holy and righteous name. Praise be your name for all of creation and for all life. As we gather around your table, we join with Christians in mind and spirit across our city, state, nation, and world to proclaim you as our Savior, King, Lord, and Teacher. We thank you for the sacrifice of your Son, the shedding of his blood, and the giving of his life to pay for our sins. We thank you that because of his sacrifice, there is no more separation from you, that you have adopted us to be your sons and daughters. And we thank you for your love, peace, mercy, and grace that flow to us daily, even when we don't deserve it. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, amen.